Reverend Time has said that there has never been a time Nigerians have been so divided along various lines than now. And um, we've been trying to find an explanation and then perhaps recommend how these lines could be blurred more so that Nigerians will continue to live together as one. And that's brought us to here, Abelkuta, to meet with first West African Nobel laureate, Professor Wolesio Inka. Thank you so much for giving us your time graciously on this interview. Let's begin with, uh, you are on record to have said that the president was a born again Democrat. At what point exactly did you begin to have a change of mind? You know, when we remember your pronouncements and your positions prior to 2015 general election, at what point exactly did you begin to witness, you know, things that compelled you to change your mind, you know, to wh wh where it is now? I can date it. I can time it exactly. It is when the depredations, the, the massacre of the Benue people began by, and provably, by the um, Fulani herdsmen. And for a long time, I, I even held back judgment, saying, wait a minute, could they be bandits? Could they be Boko Haram, etc., etc.? And then the Meeti Allah opened its mouth, not only to acknowledge responsibility, but to threaten a state within this conglomeration that we call Nigeria to threaten the government of that stage, further killings for exercising its constitutional rights to defend its own people. And the president went there, after a long time, long position, went there and said, oh, you people should learn to live together like neighbors. That's the that was for me personally the defining moment. And from that moment on, I started watching his conduct is in action, etc., etc., and as I've said in the previous interviews, including one, a long one with the okay, Bay, I actually pleaded with the ruling party not to field him in the ensuing uh, uh, election. I said, please find a new candidate, and we'll even try and be somebody credible. We'll even try and rally around him. I met the leadership of the APC, the ruling party. I said. This man is not good for Nigeria. Okay, that, that's the, the... That was my defining moment. Th that's the defining moment for you. Mm. I, I, you just mentioned bandits and Boko Haram in one sentence without really having a separation of what is what and who is who. Are you part of the people, part of Nigerians who have difficulty in knowing whether it is Boko Haram or bandits that are carrying out some of these acts that are threatening the peace of the country? Just recently, uh, the governor of Niger State lamented and cried out openly that uh, his state is almost slipping off his hands and uh, because of what is happening in Niger, these uh, bandits, quote and unquote, are very close to the seat of power in Abuja. Do you have that difficulty in separating Boko Haram and bandits? Uh, no, not any longer. Not any longer. I've spoken a lot to uh, even security people here. Uh, not for the first time. I hate referring to this uh, all the time, but unfortunately, I think I should keep reminding people that I actually had a long meeting with the late um, um, director of uh, National Security Advisor, Azazi, before he died, a long discussion. And both the security, not just the civilian section, not just me, even the security at the beginning had a problem identifying, distinguishing between Boko Haram and uh, um, the bandits and the Fulani herdsmen. So all of us underwent this, uh, this situation, this confusion. That is no longer the case. The security agencies of this nation, the governors, many of the politicians, they know which is which. Some of them know to whom they pay, um, not bribe, um, appeasement money. Shegumi knows the difference. When he goes into the bush, he knows whether he's meeting bandits or Boko Haram or a herdsman, and then he comes out and makes proposals to the nation. So I, I don't think that difficulty exists any anymore? longer. Okay, mm. you, you just mentioned Che Gumi. Uh, he has been in the news for interfacing with bandits and coming out to make recommendations, as you said. Part of the recommendations he made recently is that govern uh, the bandits deserve amnesty, just like the Niger Delta uh, militants were giving amnesty. What's your assessment of his efforts so far in trying to uh, bring down what is turning out to be you know, a huge flame in that part of the country. You see, those who still 
re, uh, try to equate what is going on in certain parts of the country which we as, uh, associate with banditry. Those who try to quit, uh, equate it with, um, with, shall we say, the secessionist efforts, some of which have included um, violence, which we condemn, which I condemn uh, uh, personally. But those who place them on the same level, I think they're not honest people. It's such different, it's like saying Evans, the kidnapper who kept his prisoners in Lagos for, uh, I forget how many years, uh, is a revolutionary or is struggling in the interest of any, any group of people beyond himself. The bandits are armed, violent robbers. They are slave takers. We're back to the age of slavery. I mean, that's quite clear. Boko Haram says it's motivated by some religious impulse. They don't disguise it. They have their flag. You see where they implant that black flag. It's Boko Haram. And they say they are doing the work of God. They are liars, of course. They are hypocrites and blasphemers. But at least you know. And they do not hesitate to accept what they're doing and to declare their intention to Islamize the entire world if they can. Iswap, the same thing. There are those who've used the camouflage of religion in many ways. I've written about Zamfara, for instance. Zamfara was just busy mining gold away, taking it outside, but using one of the governors when he was there, using the camouflage, the distraction of religion, to say he wants to impose uh, a, religion, a Sharia uh, situation, isolating, separating the sexes, etc. Et this is all a distraction, and it's all come out in the wash. So we also know that section. We know the criminality of some governors. Similarly, bandits have decided that kidnapping human beings, killing some, even drinking the blood of some, as acknowledged by uh, some of their, uh, some of their, their worst uh, sadistic uh, killers, that say, oh yes, we drink their blood so as to get more energy. And they are the ones who collect uh, ransom from anybody indiscriminately who kidnap anyhow, who waylay buses, public transport, etc., etc. We know all of them. The security people know all of them. So for Sheikh Gumi or any politician, uh, those who by now equate, no matter even if we condemn the methods, those equate secessionist motions who place them on the same level as kidnappers for ransom, for money, indiscriminate victims, etc. They are not honest people. And they're not patriots, they're not even humans sometimes, I think. Okay, before we get off this uh, terrain where we are now, uh, not long ago, southern governors met and uh, banned open grazing. That stirred, you know, a lot of controversy um, between them and some other sections of the country. Um, the situation everywhere, around that around this region which perhaps you have your own tale of you know to tell about the invasion of cattle into your premises had been of concern to many now with that controversy where do you think the power of the governors lie in determining what happens around them and secondly the rights of the Fulani people who are herders and migrate from one place to another, wouldn't, be, wouldn't it be infringed upon by such restrictions placed by the governors? Now, we've reached <coughs> a very big subject, and actually a very simple one. If you drive, let's say you're going to Ibadan, from here, from Abeokuta, and you take the shortcut through Ogiri, uh, I don't know what the situation is like because there's some work going on now, but just before rejoining uh, Atugiri, rejoining the expressway, if you look on the right side, in fact I wanted to go back and take a photograph, if you look on the right side, you will actually see among uh, human uh, dwellings, you'll actually see a corral of section containing cattle. Nobody has ever quarreled with the cattle, rearers there, the cattle live together in perfect amity with the people. The herders, the rearers, they take food to the cattle. Now that's a miniature ranch, which has been there I don't know for how long, but nobody quarrels with it. I want to use um, an analogy 
of the the railway. It's a it's a it's a good opportunity, in fact. Uh, don't let me forget this. I want to come back to the a publication on Sunday, this Sunday, I think Sunday Guardian, which uh, sort of uh, pitted Governor Adamu against uh, Bash, Bash, uh, Busari, the uh, senator, you know, over this issue, which each side stating their position about the legality, the constitutionality of the action of the governors. But let us leave constitutionalism alone for a moment and just talk about natural justice, business, enterprise, etc. We, we need to set this straight once and for all so we can leave the subject and attend to remedial action. Because it seems to me that we're being pushed constantly by careless statements to revisit things which have been said over and over again. So let's take the railway. The railway, uh, uh, which is a very grand vision, by the way, they have d had discussions with the minister, and I can see how they want, really want, how this government, uh, Buhari in particular, want to open up the nation to railways, facilitate communication, promote trade, and therefore business, open up the country. It's a magnificent vision, and I hope that it is achieved. But in the process of achieving it, the federal government just didn't say, you know, put a surveyor there, put a surveyor there, draw a straight line, you know, uh, to have the easiest, you know, most obvious, you know, as the crow flies, straight line, bulldoze its way uh, through and say we're taking over this property. If you talk to the minister and those involved in the railway, they tell you that the most difficult part and most expensive part of building that railway is negotiating with the owners, with the house owners, the businesses, the farms, taking them over. This is what a democracy is about. It's difficult, it's more arduous, but eventually you have the people behind you because you've taken them with you and you have not infringed on their rights. Now, the railway serves everybody, whether you're a cattle railer or you're a, uh, a farmer, you're a pig uh, uh, farmer, uh, you're, you're a textile person, it serves everybody. So this is uh, uh, an initiative of benefit to the entire Nigerian nation, irrespective of who. Now, what is it that then makes cattle track, cattle roots? Why should that be different? How can you sit in Asurok and say that somebody is doing cattle business and therefore has a right to just plow a path through this place which I paid for and which I built and developed on my own. And we've been told again and again by authorities that the, cons the Constitution does not give the President such rights. And yet, after the governors have taken a stand on this and the people have been crying out, he comes on air and says that he has instructed his attorney general to dig up some moth-eating uh, uh, decrees from colonial times and that he's going to resurrect those roots. And the newspapers just a few days ago again stated that about 400 and something roots have been, uh, have been uncovered and they are already been uh, res uh, resuscitated. Uh, this, is, this is why I say um, Abu Hari is showing that he's evolved from being a quote-unquote uh, born-again Democrat to being a born-again Fulani and an autocratic one at that. And it cannot pass. When a government acts like that at the center, he's effectively declaring war on the Nigerian people. And I don't think Buhari wants to go down in history as having started some version of civil conflict simply because he wants to be more Fulani than the Nigerian president of this nation. We're barely two years to the next general election and um, it appears the heat is, you know, gathering momentum gradually and as it comes with it, a more divided entity called Nigeria. What would you recommend, the steps, clear steps you would recommend to the government to ensure that 
the election will come and Nigeria will remain one entity. My answer to that is a very drastic one. It requires self-sacrifice. It requires even uh, abandonment of uh, a w willing, self-sacrificial abandonment of certain powers. Uh, right now, the distrust is on such a level that I find that the only solution before the next election is for Buhari to rise above himself and say, all right, I want a government of national unity for the run-up to elections. Um, I want to govern with people of different, you know, um, different tendencies, just to see that it's possible to have a neutral phase in a nation's life, that is non-partisan phase, and to ensure that whatever emerges, whether from constitution or whatever, is done with the consensus of everybody. On so many levels, and again, I say this very carefully, on so many levels, this government led by Buhari has failed this nation, which is a great pity, a great pity because there are so many bright people also in his cabinet. So it's, Buhari has got to bring himself to the point where he listens more, where he examines things a bit more closely. The box stops at his desk. He should stop relying on this sort of uh, mysterious cabal which is so set, hell-bent, on gathering all the zones of authority, policy-making, even catering services between states, gathering this in their own hands for their own purpose. And unfortunately, Buhari is seeming to serve at their arrowhead. He's got to abandon that posture and bring in others. The last lap, a kind of government of national unity, however, you know, lose. Now, June 12th has become the Democracy Day in Nigeria. Um, from, night, from 2018, it wasn't pronounced by anyone else than that same President Buhari. President Olusegun Basanjo, who is from this state, was president for eight years. He didn't do it. Another president from the South was president for five years, good luck Jonathan, he didn't do it. It took Buhari to make June 12th the democracy day for Nigeria. What's your reaction to this first? Well, if I want to be uncharitable, I will say that elections were coming and he wanted to throw out some palliatives here and there. But I'm even willing, I'm even willing. And of course he wanted to, uh, um, he wanted to thumb his nose at a predecessor whom we will not name. Uh, but now I'm ready to concede the possibility that he was also, also motivated by genuine democratic principles. Because I studied, as I do, I studied um, not even those who are at the very pinnacle of government, even those who are in a position, you know, who are angling for that position. And I studied Buhari very carefully. And of course, no, I, don't, I didn't see him day to day. Those around him, as their opinion, how he responded to events, what had been happening to him since he tasted the other side of power. You know, remember he was locked up uh, in detention for quite a while, underwent the humiliation which you and I uh, undergo every day. He was tear gassed, you know, during elections. So he knew exactly what things were like. And it is possible to see that this is somebody who'd been reflecting, maybe during his period of isolation, detention, loss of power, humiliation, maybe reflecting on things. For me, uh, I'm sure both Jonathan and uh, Obasanjo will be lamenting that they failed to give that day, and thereby Nigerians their due, because it was a unique election. It was an exceptional election acknowledged by the entire world it was something to be proud of so why didn't they mark it why didn't they let nigerians celebrate at least that attainment so whether people like it or not to buhari has a credit for that all right um, let me take you back to that 
day, 7th of July, 1998, when um, MQ Abiola was pronounced dead. Where were you at the time that announcement was made and what was your first reaction? Oh, my immediate reaction was that Nigeria was dead. Dead. I said Nigeria, I remember that much. Where I was, I can't remember. I think I was traveling a lot during that period. Uh, and remember, I was, the reason I'm a bit confused is that, um, again, we had received information outside, by the way, that an attempt, I've written about it, uh, and you must set forth at dawn. We received information that an attempt we made on his life. And I took the step of uh, obtaining audience with Kofi Annan, who was then Secretary General of the UN, asking him, begging him, to please intervene as quickly as possible, see Abiola in, uh, in prison. Uh, in fact, he was in, Kofi Annan was on his way uh, to Nigeria at the time. He assured me that he would see him. And I said, he's got to do something quickly because we received inside information, which had always been reliable all throughout the time of uh, Abacha. We had our inside insiders. In fact, some of whom, to whom we're grateful for being alive today because they alerted us on so many things. And so when I received this information, I sought audience with uh, Kofi Annan. We met in Europe and he assured me that he would come there. So when eventually the news came, that's why I find it so difficult to pinpoint where I was because I was still outside uh, the country. But my instinct was Nigeria is dead, deserves to be dead, deserves to be wiped off the surface of the earth and just forgotten completely. That was my feeling. Okay, e even after his death, would you think that MK Abiola left a legacy in Nigeria's polity and Nigeria's history? And if you think so, what are those you could, you can remember, you know, quickly? All I have to do is contrast him with what Buhari is today. The difference is clear. Abiola brought this nation together. Buhari has been dividing this nation by his actions and lack of actions, as I said, a critical moment. Abiola impacted on every corner of this nation. He was not just, I don't like to use the word detribalized, but he, he rose above uh, ethnic uh, uh, allegiances. He rose above religion. That's very critical. He rose above religion. He gave to Muslims, he gave to Christians, he gave to animists, he treated political opponents and supporters alike like just human beings and fellow Nigerians. I interacted very closely with him, as you probably uh, remember. And uh, who knows, perhaps it is good for us in some way, though I hate that language, that his life was short because he died on a very high note, a, a note which had not been attained by any leader ever since. Um, any aspect, just name it. Now I want to pick your mind. What do you see of Nigeria? Do you, would you recommend there are different demands of secession? You may not identify with it or recommend them, but what would you see for Nigeria? A deliberate effort to stay together or a deliberate effort to find different ways of loosening up, even if we still have to relate in some ways. What's your clear position on this? A preference, obviously, is loosen up, but somehow continue to relate together. I mean, I, uh, it could be sentimental. <clears throat> All I just demand is that people should stop considering it the original sin for anyone to say, let us split up. It's a most natural, under certain circumstances, it's a natural tendency. I should just, I, I, I don't want to hear anymore. I will continue here it's anyway, can't help it. But I, I just hate hearing the business of non-negotiable. What is that? We're human beings. We exist. 
by negotiations. And the terms of our relationship are always open to negotiations. When you say it's non negotiable, you say Nigerians uh, have only half a head in relation to other peoples all over the world. People have always negotiated the terms of their staying together. And when those negotiations fall, the most civilized among them have always said, how long should it take for us to go through the process of separating? And can we do it without really hurting the humanity, you know, which we are sworn, and you know, whose welfare we, we are elected to uphold and enhance? Anywhere you go in the world, you will always find movements of secession, movements of amalgamating. Spain has just got over its own episode and it's not yet complete, it's not yet over. Ireland, uh, Wales, all of them from time to time, they find reasons why they think the humanity, and this is the issue, is it the real estate that makes up the nation or is it the humanity? I mean, I've used the expression, let nations die, that humanity may survive. If that is what it takes, yes, let nations die. But you cannot say that you worship real estate. No, you hold it so sacrosanct that you cannot break it, reshape it, according to the needs of humanity, along the lines of the development of humanity, you know, which is never, humanity is never static. I don't accept that. But I'm always willing to argue for the positives of staying together. We discuss it as an objective, pragmatic issue, not as a kind of theology. Uh, that's really to debase human intellect. That's a fine way to end it, and we appreciate your time so much. Professor Wolesho um, it's a big privilege um, having this time with you. Thank you so much. You're welcome. And to you that watched, we are grateful that you did. Let's do it again. Thank you so much.